and it helped me qualify for my first year on the World Cup tour, competing with athletes all around the world. And our coach had to sit down and write down what our goals were for the year. And I thought about it and I wrote down that I wanted to win a World Cup in my first season on the tour. And there was a teammate who was a friend of mine, also a rookie on the tour, and she looked over at my piece of paper and said, you can't do that, no one wins a World Cup in their first year. And I thought about it and she said, you know, you should put something more realistic like a top 10 finish like I have. And I remember that my parents told me in order to accomplish great things, you have to commit to great things. And so I kept it on the piece of paper, turned it into my coach and proceeded with my season and I certainly wasn't winning any World Cups, but I was having some successes, and we were about two contests away from the end of the year. And we looked out to the hill and got out to the site, and the weather had moved in. It was fog sitting over the site, the winds were picking up, there was clouds, there was rain, there was snow, it was a miserable day outside, and they decided they'd have a safety meeting to see if they would hold the contest or not. And no one wanted to upset the Japanese organizers who were new to the tour. And so they decided to go with the second safest option to canceling the contest. They would just hold the women's contest. <laughs> we were their sacrificial lambs. So we went out to the hill and we got up to the top of the site. And as we were standing up top, the fog had gotten so thick that you couldn't see the jump in front of you. And I turned to a Russian girl, Natalia Orokova, who was standing next to me. And I said, what do we do? We can't even see the jumps. And she said, don't worry, you'll see it when you get to it. <laughs> now, believe it or not, that wasn't all that reassuring to me. But I looked in line, and all the top girls on the tour were not stepping out of the line. And I realized that if I wanted to win a World Cup like I had committed to on that piece of paper, I had to stay in line that day. And sure enough, when we'd get down to about 25 feet in front of the jump, you could make out the lines of the outside of the jump, and you could go and flip and twist into a foggy abyss. And about an hour and a half after that first practice jump, my teammate and friend, who was also a rookie, got her first top 10 finish. And 15 minutes after that, I won my first World Cup. And I realized, thank you. <laughs> I realized how important it was to have that commitment, to have it written down on a piece of paper, and to make myself accountable to reaching those goals. And that point was driven home to me a few years later when I got to meet Muhammad Ali. And I asked Muhammad Dali if he had any secrets to success. And the one thing he told me is to keep your goals in your pocket. And I'm someone who writes my goals down and I pride myself on knowing what my goals are, but I certainly didn't carry them with me. But I did understand what he meant. By keeping our goals with us, it can remind us all the time of what we're striving for. And it can push us past some of the hurdles and obstacles that are in front of us. And I got to work with the athletes as a sports psychologist all the athletes going to the Olympic Games in four out of the last five Olympics. And I had the athletes write down their goals and keep it with them in their pockets when they got to the Games. And I had athletes come up to me afterwards and said it was almost like burning a hole into their heart because it was that reminder that was sitting with them constantly of what they were striving for. And it would push them past wanting to go out at night. It would push them past going to other events. It would push them through their training, pushing themselves that much harder because they knew that goal was sitting right there with them. And it really helped me to have that understanding of what I was striving for. And a few years after my first World Cup win, I qualified for my first Olympic Games in 1994. And the reporters came up to me and they stuck a microphone in my face and said, Nikki Stone, what are your goals here at the Olympic Games? And I said, my goal is to take part. I'm just happy to be here. It was my safety mechanism. It was my out. In case I didn't do well, I told everyone that I was just happy to be there and happy to take part. I wasn't ready to make myself accountable to the world. And the anxiety built over the two weeks I had to wait for my sport to start. And how it works in aerials is you get two jumps in semifinals, the top 12 women and the top 12 men go on to finals. So I went out to the hill on the first day of semifinals and a coach told me, try to imagine it like it's every other day. I don't know about all you, but every other day, I don't have a billion people watching me on their TV sets around the world. So I was nervous. I managed to calm myself down for my first jump. I went off the jump, did two flips, a single full twist, landed it, skied to the bottom of the hill, and found I was in first place. Well, now I had to find every TV camera possible and said, USA is number one. Started dancing for the cameras, started thinking I could win an Olympic gold medal. They're going to have parades for me when I get home. Leno and Letterman are going to ask me to go on their shows. 
I wasn't even in finals, and I was already thinking about that Olympic medal. And with all this extra excitement, I went back to the top of the hill to take my second jump. I went down the hill, off the jump, two flips, two full twists, impeccable form. I came around for my landing, looked at the ground, and realized I was still three feet off the snow. My skis skidded past the landing. I hit my back in the snow, popped back up, skied to the bottom of the hill, and came to a stop. Well, I was the last girl to go, so I would know if I was in the top 12. But as luck would have it, the electricity went out, and the scoreboard went down. And I had to wait five minutes before they finally announced my score. And as I stood there, I thought to myself, well, I was first after the first round. All I have to be is in the top 12. I had some higher degree of difficulty than some of the girls. I had better form than some of the girls. Just put me in that top 12 position. Well, they finally came over the loudspeaker and said, from the United States of America, Nikki Stone, 13th place. I missed finals by 0.57, less than one point. And the girl who did sit in 12th place, the girl that I would have bumped out of the finals, was a girl named Lena Cheritsova from Uzbekistan. And Lena went ahead to go win the first gold medal in the sport of aerial skiing, the girl that I would have bumped out of finals. And I had to go watch her stand on the podium and listen to her anthem play. And I realized I don't like the Uzbekistan national anthem. <laughs> but I realized it was so important for me to have an understanding of how I had to have the focus when I got out to the hill. We become overwhelmed and distracted and fatigued when we think too far ahead at the big picture, rather than focusing on the elements that are gonna help us get there. And I'd like to carry you through an exercise that I learned at my first Olympic Games, and I wish that I had been learned this before I got to the 1994 Olympics. So what I'm gonna have you do is you're all gonna stand up for me. And we're gonna work on our focus, and we're gonna have a goal. And our goal is going to be to chant the words, when turtles fly, success won't pass me by because we're taking these turtles, we're building them up, and we want to make them soar. So we're going to start by saying this saying, when turtles fly, success won't pass me by, again and again, and we're going to have a repetition for this, and then I'm going to keep adding layers onto that. So are you ready? When turtles fly, success won't pass me by. When turtles fly, and you're going to pat your head as you're doing this with one hand. And with the other hand, you're going to do a circle around on your stomach. And then what I call the rodeo cowboy. So after each three times, you're going to do a full turn. So keep going with that. And then if you get a Frisbee, pass it on to someone else. If you get the Frisbee, pass it on. And then there's always the chance that you could go viral tomorrow. <laughs> All right, you guys can have a seat. You've been good sports. All right, who can tell me what the goal was? <laughs> to keep chanting, when turtles fly, success won't pass me by. And each time we added on another layer, what happened? We started losing it. And every time more fun is presented, what happens to our goals? We start losing sight of them. And the more fun it is, and the more success you have, we start losing sight of what we need. And so we have to make sure we're focusing on what our goals are. Maybe it's digital marketing, maybe it's increasing the sale, maybe it's retention with your clients. Whatever that goal is, we have to make sure we keep that focus. And there are going to be distractions that we can't help. You know, a frisbee flying at your head, you obviously can't ignore that, so you can't put blinders up. You have to make sure that you're looking at some things that can be distracting and pulling away from you. Maybe a sick child at home. Maybe there's an issue at work that you can't put out the fire. And so we have to make sure that even though we're handling some of these distractions, we're still looking forward to whatever our goal is and be reminded of that goal time and time again. And I learned this at my first Olympic Games, and it was such a powerful message to me 